thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for having me for the second time um it has become like my second home after the england i'm so happy to see the enthusiastic uh, trainees and residents sitting in the back today we are going to discuss the advances in the urethrorhinoscopy it is very important to know which direction we are traveling and what is our destination when you plan any travel isn't it so this presentation will give you a kind of an idea about what are all the advances happens in the western world i'm pretty sure in good teaching centers like what professor hamad and yourself in hyderabad have got you may already have these technologies in place but it's nice to know what further is possible and what are all the research opportunities available um thank you for this opportunity jawad has become my very close friend now we share lots of messages on various events etc professor ahmad is the main backbone for everything he is the person who introduced me to this whole concept of pakistan urology and uh, thank you wakar also for keeping me in this webinar i've taken lot of references from this important article i will throw some references in between so that uh, the trainees who are interested can go and dive in into a deep learning advances in urethroscopy this particular publication in journal of clinical urology in 2022 is a landmark article i am sure any of your trainees interested in the stone related treatment should have access to this if there is any problem in getting the full article please message me i am quite happy to send the full copy with this advancements our aim is to create a tailored endourological stone treatment it's known as abbreviation of test what is the tailored endourological stone treatment gone are the days where a patient any patient come with stone whether it's a lower uric stone upper uric stone whether it's 5 mm stone or 15 mm stone the approach is the same now the whole concept of urethroscopy is tailored with the help of the knowledge and technology we have got good improvement in the knowledge in the laser functioning laser settings how to reduce the complications patients are very much educated we give information leaflet to the patients in the clinic they google and in youtube they learn about the procedure what the doctor is going to do we got quite advancements in imaging with less radiation we got very specific patient related outcome measures so it's not just the surgeon's wish to see that stone clearance what the patient feels how quickly the patient is up on his feet and back to his job and what is the environmental impact especially i will dwell on the disposable urethroscopes there is so much of impact on the carbon footprint and uh, there is so much of advancements in surgical simulation in training and our technology is growing at one point we thought that okay we got the flexible urethroscopes we can reach any part in the kidneys that's it it's very important and we can't improve this technology any further but we know now even with flexible urethroscopes the technologies are improving robotic platforms mineralization is in the process we got artificial intelligence which helps us to decide the correct methodology and we got pressure sensors to reduce the intra renal pressure various improvements in visions and optics we are going to discuss today we are now seeing more non indexed patients <clears throat> by indexed patients is a standard like for example 30 year old no medical comorbidities say bmi of 20 presenting with a 5 mm mid uric stone and buj is absolutely allowing your equipment and laser is working but non indexed patients means patients with uh, something different like for example patients who are pregnant extremes of age patients with anomalous kidneys these kind of kidneys with congenital abnormalities or transplant kidneys have become very common and we are seeing more number of non indexed patients i've got some references here for the trainees who are interested this advancements we are going to discuss in various sub topics the first one is the laser 
and the components of laser like pulse modulation, high power systems, etc. Then the vision and the optics, a little bit on the robotic control system and role of simulation. The thulium fiber laser, it's no more a new one. I think some of you may have thulium fiber laser in your institute. Use of disposable electroscopes and advancements in irrigation. We all know that the holmium laser has become quite standard. Gone are the days where people are using lithotripsy via thin lithotripsy probes into the urethroscope. For any upper track or urethroscopes, holmium laser is the go-to energy source. Of course, for PCNL, we have other modalities like, for example, triology, etc. For bladder, we can still use the age-old gold standard stone punch, etc. Holmium lasers, the YAG is constituted by yttrium aluminium garnet. It works by photothermal effect, at least those who are going for exams, in exams they will ask how the holmium act works. Photothermal effect is the one where the energy is absorbed mainly in the water molecules between the pores and cracks of the stones. This results in water molecules to expand, stone breakage and chemical decomposition. Three things you need to know whenever you are using a laser is power which is in watts and pulse energy which is in joule and frequency which is in hertz. Power is the product of pulse energy into frequency. So pulse energy and frequency are the two main things you adjust in your equipment which gives you the total power. The key improvement in the holmium is we are able to achieve quite high peak powers in the region of 1000 or 2000 watts nowadays with good machines like 120 watts machines and also it comes in a pulsed manner. It's not a continuous energy, it's a pulsed energy and this pulsed energy work like a hammer drill compared to a rotary drill which vibrates and works continuously. We know that a hammer drill will cause a better destruction of the stones in our construction work. This high power holmium lasers have got quite nicely collimated multiple synchronized laser cavities and uh, since it maintains low pulse energy by increasing the frequency we can ablate the stones without need for active removal which means we can do stone dusting and there are some studies which said that if you are able to dust the stones up to say 250 microns then there is no need for any active removal a good wash intraoperatively and good water intake and hydration by the patients postoperatively is enough to clear. How to be confident that the dust particles what we created is less than 250 micron? The commonest uh, laser fiber I use in my practice is 200 micron. So I can compare the stone fragments produced to the tip of the laser fiber. It's a very easy comparison to see whether we have dusted the stone adequately. After dusting, we can even aspirate and send that uh, aspiration with the dust for stone analysis. So it's not necessary that we need to really get a chunk of the stone for the stone analysis. And pop dusting is the one which is known as the end game strategy, where after dusting, if you have good number of chunky particles, especially in the lower calyx, you can go for a good energy setting of 0.3 to 0.6 joules but quite high frequency up to 40, jo 40 frequency um, hertz where you can very clearly create a nice pop dusting which is more quicker also. And long pulse width, the pulse width can be increased up to 650 to 1215 microseconds. By increasing the pulse width, the ability to dust will be quite high. These are possible in the high-end machines or high volt machines. And there are some advancements happened in the pulse shape modulation. So even though compared to lithotripsy, the laser has got decreased retropulsion, sometimes even with the laser, the stone will slowly migrate. And especially if the stone is a PUJ stone, we don't want the stone to drop into the lower calyx, necessitating to open a flexible urethroscopes, making the job a bit challenging. So the techniques like MOSES technology, 
where it generates a split pulse which means first there will be a modulating pulse shape which creates a opening in the cavity and it also indirectly holds the stone and then the second pulse will deliver the energy which breaks the stone in other marketing people like quanta it is also known as virtual basket which means there is no basket you can't see the basket that's why it's virtual but it works like a basket it prevents the stone to propulsion it holds the stones in the place again quite high technology could be possible only in the high end machines but uh, i'm pretty sure some of your institutes may have these high end machines thulium fiber laser 3 years back 4 years back it is like talk of the town or talk of the world but now most of the institutes have got this thulium fiber laser it increases the stone ablation four times quicker it can fragment all stone types just like holmium laser we can achieve frequencies as high as 2000 hertz because of this the dusting happens is very very fine dust and um, the dusting efficiency as is improving we don't have to go multiple times in and out in removing the fragments we don't have to use the baskets so it is also sometimes cost efficient and the thulium fibers have come down in size as you know holmium available in say for example 200 micron 350 micron 500 microns but thulium fiber lasers are available as thin as 50 microns thinner the laser fiber diameter it will occupy less space in the working channel so you have better irrigation and you can also control the irrigation which gives you a better vision now coming to the erythroscopes the modern erythroscopes have got lot of advancements and changes previously in the flexible erythroscopy we used to have fiber optic one which has got a uh, sometimes honeycomb effect if any one of the fiber get broken you can see that uh, a honeycomb shape defect will appear in the screen but even with one or two honeycombs we tend to complete the procedure we tend to use the scope as much as possible now all those honeycomb effects were cleared by using the digital scopes where we have the quartz bunzels which are able to take the digital picture from the tip of the erythroscope we call it as the chip on the tip technology the one advantage of this digital system is the capturing of the image happens in the tip of the erythroscope and the laser fiber working is also happening in few millimeter distance so this can sometimes cause the image flickering but those deficiencies were now addressed too and miniaturization of the erythroscopes even the disposable erythroscopes previously say for example the lithoview from boston scientific comes in the region of say 9 french but the newer products like pusen and various other competitors have come down to 7.5 french especially in the tip the smaller fibers allows us to use the smaller thinner thulium fiber laser like as i said 20 microns this will help us to do the procedure without causing much of uh, urethral damage and we can do the procedures in a pre stented patient or patients who never had any stent and uh, it is quite useful to reach the kidney and treat the transitional cell cancers also as we discussed disposable technology is coming up the issue with disposable technology is two front one is the high price and also significant environmental impact of carbon footprint but it's all individual in very big units when we did studies they found that the number of patients which can be treated by using a flexible reusable erythroscopes ranges from something like 8 to 50 but i have come across my teachers who have used a disposable erythroscopes even up to 100 patients or 150 patients it requires a lot of thinking and uh, a bit of a carefulness from the surgeon and also the theater team decontamination team everything the whole chain should handle the erythroscope like a precious uh, object but having said that if you have a very difficult stone if it's like a acute angle and if the stone volume is more the patient had previous history of significant uh, 
quite uh, rare uh, UTI due to a bug which is like resistance to all the antibiotics. These are the situations where if you use the disposable technology, you are not much bothered about the injuring the scope. You will be focusing on treating the stone and making the patient stone free and patient is also not exposed to a possible super bug and we are not contaminating the decontamination units on the supply chain. So various uh, suppliers again like Boston Scientific Lithview and Poussin have come out with multiple models now and uh, maneuverability, vision, deflection are slowly getting better. So we need to discuss the true cost benefit ratio in this but it all depends upon your individual institutes, uh, usage, volume, etc. And uh, a hybrid model where you have access to the disposable technology, but at the same time, your work costs should be the reusable, flexible ureteroscopes. That will be a more uh, a good approach. Ureteral access sheets. The evidence to support ureteral access sheet is quite too prong. There are some good advancements, especially after 1970s and 1990s. They are all hydrophilic uh, coated access sheets and the access sheets are now available where with a hub locking mechanism where we can lock the access sheet into the ureteroscope. So as you move with the ureteroscope, the access sheet will also move with you. It improves the vision as we know, it reduces the intrarenal pressure and if you are a duster or maybe like a fragmenter, you, you can go in and out multiple times without need for a guide wire, a working guide wire. It really protects against the intrarenal pressure, so it's very good for patients who had previous history of sepsis post ureteroscopy. But as far as the stone clearance is concerned, the large studies which I quoted there did not show any major difference. Pressure control. Uh, you may have seen lots of tweets and publications from the stone experts like Oliver Traxer. And uh, physiologically, we don't want the intra renal pressure to go high. Normally, it is only few centimeters of water. During the ureteroscope, the pressure can go easily up to even 30 centimeters of water. It is quite clearly proven that if the intrarenal pressure goes even in the region of 13.6 to 27, there is a fornicial rupture possibility and there is a pylovenous backflow. These are the patients, even though you create a good stone clearance, post-operatively can become septic, may require even nephrostomy and uh, if the stent, JJ stent is not placed, we may have to do a JJ stent and patient may have quite prolonged stay with requirement of antibiotics, etc. So, ureteral access sheath may be a very good option to do the pressure control. And there are also various methods available where uh, the pump can be controlled. The continuous actioning pump can control the pressure in the tip. We have small sensors which can be kept in the tip of the access sheet or in the tip of the ureteroscope where the pressure is sensed and accordingly automatically the pump will make sure that it is not giving you an extra push in the irrigation. Uh, I use passive gravitation and a uh, stone uh, pathfinder. So I use the pressure only when I need. If the vision is good, you don't have to use the pathfinder and even the irrigation, you can reduce the height or close the valve accordingly. Continuous monitoring with the help of the embedded wires have become now the very research oriented system. There are intelligent systems reported as I said, which maintains intrarenal pressure by giving a pressure feedback to the source of the pump and also like a vacuum platform to reduce the pressure. We need to plan the operation not only during the procedure and also the aftercare. There are nomograms available which helps in patient counseling. Now with the help of the nomograms we can say which group of patients have more chances of say overnight stay or post-op infection etc. And uh, there are lots of big studies available with patient related outcomes, patient how confident they are, how comfortable they are in the activities of daily life and how quick they are in getting up into the normal days work activities. And uh, there are various questionnaires available like Wisconsin Stone Quality of Life Questionnaire which gives us an idea about how quickly the quality of life is returning after ultroscopy. 
you i've got all the references there i will try to send the recording of this uh, later to uh, professor jawad so that he can circulate among you where we are heading to the future is use of a more sophisticated urethral access sheath where the access sheath tip can bend so because of this you don't have the possibility of uh, breaking the flexible urethroscopes scratching against the tip of your urethral access sheath high power latest systems are already here and uh, the post urethroscope stenting has now taken a back step we try not to stent them and we try to stent only if there is an absolute necessity robotic platforms are still quite very remote and we have seen some publications in national conferences about this robotic urethroscopes even decade before but uh, it requires high upfront cost and absence of the tactile feedback and no big improvement in the ergonomics or the outcome is the reason they are still in the research enhanced recovery and uh, quick day surgeries where patient can walk in and go home in the same day reduced opioid use in the recovery area so that patients are not drowsy use more of simple anti inflammatory nsaids or the future directions so we have got now the equipments for temperature control so even though especially with uh, tulium laser where the chances of very high temperature is there we can see sometimes the, the urethral mucosa get quite blanched out and uh, there are some temperature control available to stop increased intraarenal temperature wireless scope connection where we don't need the image to be transferred by the cables artificial intelligence which gives us an idea about which patient requires which type of approach we can decide based upon the hounds feel you need what kind of energy source need to be used multiple axis deflection say for example as of now all the urethroscopes deflect only up or down and which you will adjust with the help of your thumb and if you want to go to any other place you need to rotate your urethroscope or you need to use an active and passive bending while a multiple axis deflection is the one where you have more control and you can have a 360 degree working bending and uh, always environmental impact and sustainability will be a backbone of all these discussions thank you for your time i've tried to cover as much of the advances happening in various electroscopic modules like scopes access sheets and uh, lasers and uh, i'm quite happy to answer any questions Thank you very much. Hello, are you listening? Uh, yeah, Dr. I can. I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation and uh, a very brief uh, introduction of uh, especially the flexible urethral scope. Um, any questions from no. my side? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Tabu. Here, uh, actually, you gave a good presentation. My theory is because you said we call new gadgets and they availability uh, because you know in our part of our as you said most of the centre would be having these kind of lasers, but we are having a thirty watt volume laser, so we don't have these uh, that uh, that advantage of the prevention of retropulsion. So before these gadgets were available to you and the basic manoeuvres such as getting the head up. And uh, slowing the irrigation flow. What else you were doing to prevent the retropulsion of stones apart from these baskets and all? Correct. And you. That's a very important question because uh, we also spent at least a decade with uh, thirty watts laser. Um, I will say stone clearance rate is exactly the same. Maybe we are able to treat the stones little bit more quicker with higher watts laser, and the dusting is a, is a good way of doing. the advices what i will give if you are using a 30 watts laser because even in centers of england there are some small centers say for example we have in our trust three centers so in smaller centers we still keep the 30 watts laser it does wonderful good job and it's very good in protecting the urethral wall the chances of complication of urethral wall injury thermal injury uretric um, uh, like a perforation which requires a stenting or all quite less in the 30 watts laser the main advantage is you need to make sure that you are using an appropriate fiber 
So with 30 watts laser, say for example, if there is a bladder stone or PCNL, don't use the big fibers like for example, 500 micron laser. Use a fiber which is like 200 to 300 microns so that an appropriate energy transfer happens. And then don't get fixed with a specific uh, joules and uh, hertz setting. Try to adjust it. If you think the stone is not moving, try to increase the frequency so that you will get nice powdery dusting. You won't get proper dusting in a 30 watt, but at least you can get some small fragments. But having said that, if the stone is quite hard, if the ounce you need is more than a thousand or thousand five hundred, then the dusting will take long time and you can reduce the frequency and uh, since you reduce the frequency you have more space for your pulse width and also the power to increase that gives you a better fragmenting as you said once we have good two to three chunks of fragments if you have a, a basket you can just go and remove the basket that will also save the operating time so 30 watt laser still holds good good machine if you have at least like two centers, you should have 30 watt laser at least in one center, which is very economical. It does the job. Stone clearance will be exactly the same. Maybe the one advantage of the bigger machine, like for example, um, a quick dusting, a popcorn effect, and uh, maybe saving some time, maybe slightly less. But as long as you use the correct laser fiber, which is a thinner fiber for 30 watt laser, it works very nice. Uh, thank you, Raghunath. Uh, one other query: In all these times when we're using the 30 watt laser, uh, and, and any in any circumstance, the basket got stuck up. So, if have you encountered that problem, and how did you come out of it? Yeah. Regarding the baskets, I don't use baskets too much nowadays because as I said, I'm uh, like a duster, they say. So I try to dust and I try to compare the stone fragments with the tip of my uh, laser fiber. My laser fiber is 200 micron. As I said, any dust which is more than 250 micron, patient can pass on it, especially if it's a young, fit patient with previous tinting, etc. If you are using a basket, you need to use the basket as a last step don't try to basket large fragments thinking that that will help you to save the time try yourself to fragment to good chunks uh, at least in the region of i will say like um, uh, one millimeter or two millimeter and uh, try to use the basket as a last thing because once you open the basket it's nice if you just use only the basket just get in get some fragments and clear it it's very confusing for the theater team if you use the basket and then go back to the laser and then open the basket again the other important thing possibly you all will know is how to dismantle the back of the basket and how to remove the handle of the basket and thus technique i wish all the trainees should learn quite early because uh, as you said once we use the basket and when we are coming out quite gradually if there is a place where it's a bit tight you can't apply any extra force you may have to leave the basket there you need you should be able to remove the handle and come out of the ultrascope and go in by the side of the basket and uh, try to use the basket just like your guide wire and uh, you should be able to even fix the handle again so that the handle will still work with the opening and closing function lot of baskets are quite good we can remove the handle and we can fix the handle again as long as you know this technique you can come out and you can go by the side of the basket and you can fragment carefully in between the baskets um, uh, throngs to break the stone once the stone is broken you can easily take out the basket there usually um, there is a kind of a teaching when i was a student that don't use baskets to hold the stone go and uh, hold the stone but not too tight hold it very gently so as you come out the prongs will be slightly loose and it will adapt to the urethral bend etc and also you should know how good is the vuj pattern when you are doing the ureteroscope if the vesicular junction is nice and open then possibly your basket can easily come out these are the factors we need to consider and as we know there are two types of baskets one is the open tip baskets and the closed tip baskets the open tip baskets are quite useful if you have no access to the 
proximal end of the stone so you can catch the stone from below but um, it's costly like for example engage baskets but if you have a good access to proximal side of the stone you can use the closed end baskets where you can pass the basket to the top open and when you bring it out the stone will fall into the basket and also there are smooth tip and round tip baskets the uh, round tip baskets are quite useful if you are working inside the kidney inside the calyces where if there is uh, no round tip the st string which is in the tip of the basket will prevent you from reaching the stone while uh, round smooth tip will go to the base of the calyx and help you to catch the stone these things possibly you all will know so use open tip basket the advantage of open tip basket is again if your stone is struck you can open the basket and if you come out a bit the stone may fall off quite easily compared to the closed uh, baskets thank you dr anwar this is dr ram from uh, department urology i want to ask one clinical question regarding <laughs> a uh, section of patients which you mentioned in your presentation uh, non indus patients uh, especially for those patients who are having ectopic kidney and impacted lower pole stones which is hard and dysphagy and uh, having an anterior or inferior angle uh, what is your experience regarding the stone players with the flexible urethroscopes after stenting the patients and going for the ri yeah so in my setting we have got an hybrid approach so whenever the patient has got like a significant stone volume we may be doing the stone for at least 1 hour of fragmentation and when there is an acute angle especially the urethro pelvic angle the calycial pelvic puj angle is less than 50 degrees we try to use a disposable urethroscope so we are not bothered about uh, injuring the urethroscope we'll focus on the stone and clear the stone the other methods as um, uh, your colleague mentioned is like positioning of the patient um, for example for the right stones i will try to keep the patient tilted slightly towards the left and vice versa by keeping this we'll try to keep the stone in the pelvis or maximum in the upper calyx which is more easy to reach while we will struggle when the stone reaches the calyces so give a slight left tilt or the opposite side tilt and uh, if the stone is reaching into an upper calyx you can even give a head down not too much little bit head down so stone stays in the upper calyx and uh, you can easily fragment it when the patient is lying flat when you are using the upper calyx fragmentation all the fragments will come out by the side of your urethroscope and end up in the lower calyx so you may have to do the lower calyx later but if you give slight head down and tilt to the opposite side the stones and the fragments will stay in the upper calyx which is the much more easily accessible calyx and when you spend more time in the upper calyx laser fragmentation your scope will be straight and the chances of uh, scope injury and chances of laser fiber breaking inside the scope will be quite low so try you can use even basket to reposition the stones into the upper calyx so if there are good amount of renal stone try to use upper calyx as your go place to park the stone and fragment the stone thank you very much uh, ananda and uh, very nice uh, to see you again dear friend thank and you. want to see you again again you have covered the topic very nicely and uh, uh, from my side uh, i have a, a single uh, question rather problem uh, we are doing a flexible uh, urethroscope routinely and done on last list as well and when we are fixing the fiber into the flexible uh, urethroscope and uh, usually if you are on a angle more than 60 70 degree and you can you cannot able to pass the fiber you have to state it and then you pass it and then you you may uh, bore curve if you go down want to uh, go down sometime i was facing difficulty in this can you help out uh, and say some tips and tricks for this uh, uh, to do this in a better way yeah this is one of the very common challenge we have during the learning curve so the best thing is keep the fiber inside the flexible urethroscope not up to the tip keep it well inside the flexible urethroscope and uh, go to a particular calyx and then just visualize how much you are bending and what is the angle you are able to reach the stone and use uh, maybe one flash in the image intensifier to see that uh, what kind of bend you need to go to the stone 
and once you are very confident that okay this is the amount of bend i need and this is where the calyx where i wish to go is available then you need to straighten the scope again and bring the laser fiber maybe 3 to 4 millimeter more than what you need so normally when you are using the laser fiber the the sheath of the laser fiber you can just see only the tip of the sheath the transparent space is more than enough for you to fragment the stone but here you need to bring out laser fiber maybe three or four millimeter more so then you you have a kind of a muscle memory so you know that what is the angle how much bend you need to go to the stone then when you do that you'll be able to reach the stone more quickly and when you do that so you will lose some of the length in the bend of the erythroscope but since you have that four millimeter more you'll be able to see the stone with the laser fiber also in place so first go without the laser fiber know the angle deflection everything and bring the straight and the lay fiber again because if we are trying to pass the laser fiber when the scope is in a bend position it can injure the working channel inside and uh, that's one of the commonest way the flexible reusable scopes can get injured and will result in water leakage and fail the leak test etc so pass the laser fiber only when the scope is in the straight line and also few millimeters more so that when you bend you will get adequate fiber length and again if you want to pass the laser fiber more sometime you may have to straighten again and you need to do it the other way as we discussed is go to the particular calyx use a basket reposition the stone in the upper calyx and then do it yes, thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr ananda and uh, uh, we are uh, hoping that we will see you again in the next time thank you very much thank you very much all the best and uh, best wishes love to see you all again see you